Well, good morning. Welcome to our Sunday morning service. We are currently studying the life of David, and this morning we'll be looking at 2 Samuel chapter 13. I titled the message, David Begins to Pay the Piper. After what we've been studying about David, he's now going to start reaping what he had sown. And this is the thing about doing things that you end up reaping the consequences. Let's go ahead and pray. We'll get into it. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for this morning that you've given us. Just thank you for another day of life on this earth, Lord. And I pray, Father, that uh, you would speak to us mightily through your word as we study it. And God, I just ask for those who are out there, those who are watching maybe for the first time, God, I just ask that you would speak to them boldly through your word. And God, that you would encourage us, that you would challenge us to want to live a holy life before you, God. Man, the rewards are so, so great when we try to live for you, Lord, when we try to do our best. So, Father, we ask that you would uh, be glorified in and through your word. Speak to us mightily, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Second Samuel 13. So what I want to do is I want to kind of recap from last Sunday. We looked at chapter 2 of, um, or chapter 12, rather, of 2 Samuel. So Nathan the prophet confronts David with his sin. You know, as if it wasn't bad enough laying with Bathsheba, but killing her husband on top of it. Well, the way Nathan does it, I mean, I love the tact that he uses. He presents David with this story. And then it causes David to cast judgment. And that judgment is cast on him. David had been covering his sin for at least six to nine months. I mean, Bathsheba's baby is about to be born. According to the law, David and Bathsheba should have both been stoned to death. Adultery and murder were both punishable by death. So without realizing it, David had sentenced and condemned himself. Now, even though the law said David should die, here's the thing about God and God's grace. God spared David's life. God put away David's sin. But the baby is going to die, and David is going to reap what he had sown. So when Nathan nailed David and told him he was the man, David finally confessed. He said, I have sinned against the Lord. Notice he had sinned against the Lord. That's what we do when we sin. It's, yeah, we're sinning against each other, but ultimately it goes back to the Lord. Unfortunately for David, his life will be one tragedy after another. So as we finish chapter 12, we see David's desire to be back in fellowship with God. He wanted to be in God's presence. You know, I think of believers that I know. I mean, I know they're Christians. I know they accepted Christ. But man, they're just, they're not living for God. They're just not living for him. They're kind of living their life and they know God, but they're not in fellowship. They're not in the word. They're not hanging out with other believers. They put themselves back into the world. Well, this morning we come to chapter 13. Things begin to happen in David's family. You know, there's an old saying, if you're going to dance, you're going to have to pay the piper. You're gonna to have to pay the piper. I mean, it means if you're guilty of playing with sin, you'll have to suffer the consequences. There's just no way around it. You know, I, I really don't think God can lay it 
any more on the line than he did in Galatians 6, verses 7 and 8. Paul writing to the church in Galatia. <clears throat> he said, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. For he who sows to the flesh, will the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit, will of the spirit reap everlasting life. David had sown to the flesh. Now he's going to start reaping. You know, the problem I see today, people think they can walk away from their sin by asking for forgiveness, being forgiven, and then that's it. Now, you know what? I totally understand. The blood of Christ does cover our sin. I totally understand that. But you will have to deal with the consequences. And you're going to have to deal with the head trips, the head games that go along with it. You know, it made me think of a, a song I used to really like. It's by a group called Foreigner. And the name of the song is called Head Games. The words of the song are speaking of a guy and his girl. Now, even though they aren't biblical, they do have a ring to what you go through. Listen to this. In the song, the guy sings, no time ever seems right to talk about the reasons why you and I fight. It's high time to draw the line, put it into this game before it's too late. Head games, it's you and me, baby, head games. And I can't take any more head games. I don't wanna play the head games. I daydream for hours, it seems, I keep thinking of you. Yeah, thinking of you. Those daydreams, what do they mean? They keep haunting me. Are they warning me? Daylight turns into night. We try and find the answer, but it's nowhere in sight. It's always the same, and you know who's to blame. You know what I'm saying. Still we keep playing head games. Head games. David is about to go through some serious head games in his family. Head trips. I mean, I can understand we'll go through things because it's a part of life. I mean, I get that. We all get that. But to have to go through things because of our sin, man, that is entirely different. Look at verse 1. <clears throat> After this, Absalom, the son of David, had a lovely sister whose name was Tamar. And Ammon, the son of David, loved her. So Tamar and Absalom were known for being very good looking. You might recall their mother's name was Maaka. She was a princess from the house of Talmai in Geshur. It was a small kingdom near what we know today as the Sea of Galilee. It is believed David took Maaka as his wife in order to establish a peace treaty with her dad, her father. Now, I'm sure Absalom knew he had royal blood from his father and from his mother. Many believe this is why he went after David's kingdom. David was her father. But we also need to keep in mind all of David's kids had different mothers. You see the problem here? Look at verse 2. Ammon was so distressed over his sister Tamar that he became sick, for she was a virgin. And it was improper for Ammon to do anything to her. But Ammon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimea, David's brother. That would make Jonadab Ammon's cousin. Now Jonadab was a very crafty man. And he said to him, why are you, the king's son, becoming thinner day after day? Will you not tell me? And Ammon said to him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. So 
Ammon was getting sick. He couldn't stop thinking of Tamar, his half-sister. He thought he loved her. But as we're going to see, it was only lust. It was lust. Ammon was David's oldest and most likely would have been the next heir to the throne. So it is possible he felt he could do whatever he wanted to do. It was an abnormal love to have his half-sister. <clears throat> Jesus called it adultery. There in Matthew 5, verses 27 and 28, he said, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. I think that pretty much nails every person on this planet because we've looked at people and we've lusted in our hearts after them. Now, this type of sin wasn't only wrong. It violated the standard of sexual purity established by God in his law. We read in Leviticus 18, verses 9 to 11, the nakedness of your sister, the daughter of your father, or the daughter of your mother, whether born at home or elsewhere, their nakedness you shall not uncover. The nakedness of your son's daughter, or your daughter's daughter, their nakedness you shall not uncover. For theirs is your own nakedness. The nakedness of your father's wife's daughter, begotten by your father, she is your sister. You shall not uncover her nakedness. Well, here's the deal. Ammon wanted Tamar so bad, he couldn't get her out of his mind. He was getting sick over it. He couldn't eat, he couldn't do anything. I mean, he really thought he loved her. We read here he became sick thinking about her. It's pretty bad. Look at verse five. So Jonadab said to him, lie down on your bed and pretend to be ill. And when your father comes to see you, say to him, please let my sister Tamar come and give me some food and prepare the food in my sight that I may see it and eat it from her hand. Then Ammon lay down and pretended to be ill. And when the king, when King David came to see him, Ammon said to the king, please let Tamar, my sister, come and make me a couple of cakes for me in my sight that I may eat from her hand. And David sent home to Tamar saying, now go to your brother Ammon's house and prepare food for him. So Tamar went to her brother Ammon's house and he was lying down. Then she took flour and kneaded it, made cakes in his sight and baked the cakes. And she took the pan and placed them out before him, but he refused to eat. Then Ammon said, have everyone go out from me. He had everybody leave the, the house. And they all went out from him. Then Ammon said to Tamar, bring the food into the bedroom that I may eat from your hand. And Tamar took the cakes which she had made and brought them to Ammon, her brother, in her bedroom, in, in his bedroom. Now when she had brought them to him to eat, he took hold of her and said to her, come lie with me, my sister. But she answered and said, no, my brother, do not force me, for no such thing should be done in Israel. Do not this disgraceful thing. And I, where could I take my shame? And as for you, you would be like one of the fools in Israel. Now, therefore, please speak to the king, for he will not withhold me from you. However, he would not heed her voice, and being stronger than she, he forced her, and he lay with her. Now, Ammon may have been thinking since his father committed adultery and murder, right? Bathsheba and her husband, Uriah the Hittite. And he got away, well, it seemed like it, that Ammon will also get away with it. Well, that's sin. 
It's the destructive power of following a bad example. It's sin. Proverbs 25, 26. A righteous man who falters before the wicked is like a murky spring in a polluted well. Let me tell you something. I have yet to see a person fall from a place of prominence into this kind of sin and recover to ever be used in a powerful way again. What Ammon thought was love turned out to be lust. It was a passion that so controlled everything about him, it turned him into an animal. That's what happens when people get caught up in wanting a relationship so bad that it ends up backfiring on them. It turns them into an animal. You think of nothing else but this person. God is all the picture. Everybody's all the picture except this person. So what happens? That's what lust will do. No wonder why the internet and pornography is destroying so many people and their families today. Let me give you some stats. They're a little bit old, but they're still worthy stats. The total porn industry revenue for 2006, 13.3 billion in the United States. You know it's a lot worse today. $97 billion worldwide. U.S. adult DVD video rentals in 2005, almost 1 billion. Hotel viewership for adult films, 55%. Number of hardcore pornography titles released in 2005, 13,588. Can you even imagine what it is today? Adults admitting to internet sexual addiction, 10%. 28% of those are women. 10% men, 28% women. More than 70% of men from the age of 18 to 34 visit a porno pornographic site in a typical month. At a 2003 meeting of the American Academy of Matrimonial Lawyers, two thirds of the 350 divorce lawyers who attended said the internet played a significant role in the divorces in the past year with excessive interest in online porn contributing to more than half such cases. Pornography had an almost non-existent role in divorce just seven or eight years before. Guys, let me tell you something, man. I have counseled men who have gotten caught up in lust. They told me before long, Rick, I had to literally start acting it out because I couldn't stop thinking about it. I had to act it out. Oswald Chambers said, love can wait and worship endlessly. Lust says, I must have it now. I must have it now. Look at verse 15. Then Ammon hated Tamar exceedingly. So, the hatred with which he hated her was greater than the love which, would he, which he loved her. And Ammon said to her, to Tamar, Arise, be gone. So she said to him, No, indeed, this evil of sending me away is worse than the other that you did to me. But he would not listen to her. Then he called his servants who attended him and said, Here, put this woman out, away from me and bolt the door behind her. Now she had on a robe of many colors, for the king's virgin daughters were, wore such apparel. And his servant put her out and bolted the door behind her. Then Tamar put ashes on her head, tore her robe of many colors that was on her, and laid her hand on her head and went away crying bitterly. 
Notice before Ammon sinned. He wanted Tamar for himself. But after he sinned, he couldn't get rid of her fast enough. God, again, I can't begin to tell you how many people that had gotten caught up in sexual sins and had that same kind of emotional damage. I remember counseling a guy at my church who was driving the 15 pass, the Cajon Pass from San Bernardino up to Victorville area. Coming home from work in San Bernardino, he would text on his phone his phone number and he would, as he's on the freeway, he would show it to some girl. And that girl would call him and they'd end up pulling over part way up and getting into sexual relationship. And he came in for counseling on it. And he said, he's probably had dozens of girls a week. He's married, he's got five kids. I knew his wife, I knew his kids at the church there. And man, no matter what I shared with him, I prayed with him, you know what? He quit for about three months. And then his wife came in one day and said that he left. It eats you up like cancer, man. Because once you start entertaining with your eyes, you can't get rid of it until you do it. Until you do it. You see, when we treat other people like things to be used, you end up throwing them away like something that has no more worth. What's interesting is the word woman is not in the Hebrew text in verse 17. Ammon was actually saying this, throw this thing out, thing, not woman, thing. That's why Tamar told Ammon this was even crueler in throwing her out than by raping her. Tamar tore her robe. It was a robe that only the virgins could wear. She knew she could no longer stay with the virgins in their own rooms. It was over. It tore her apart. I don't know if Tamar ever got over that. Scripture doesn't say. I don't know if she ever got married or had children or anything. We don't have that in the scripture. <clears throat> but I know this devastated her. Look at verse 20. And Absalom, her brother, said to her, has Ammon, your brother, been with you? Notice Absalom caught on to it, man. But now hold your peace, my sister. He is your brother. Do not take this thing to heart. So Tamar remained, remained desolate in her brother Absalom's house. But when King David heard of all these things, he was very angry. David was mad. He saw now that it was a setup. Absalom, at this point, is starting to work on a plan that would do three things. Number one, avenge Tamar. Number two, get rid of Ammon. And number three, put himself next in line for the throne. Ammon, Absalom, Solomon. By saying he is your brother meant if he were any other, I'd deal with him right now. But now I'm going to wait for an opportunity. David, on the other hand, he's mad. He's ticked. But he doesn't do anything about it. David was like others in scripture. He was a father who raised kids who were unruly and bad. I thought of Eli, God's high priest. His sons weren't only immoral, they were godless. They had their own thing going on, man. Samuel's sons turned out to be just like Eli's sons, corrupt and dishonest. You know what? David knew Samuel. 
and I'm sure he also knew Samuel's sons. He probably saw what was going on with his sons. So here David's angry. But what kind of example did he set for his sons, right? This is a huge problem in Christian homes today. The father is not setting the example and disciplining his children. I got to say this. I got to say this. If you are a Christian and you have a child who is getting into all kinds of things and won't okay. listen to you in the home, don't spend your time lecturing them because you're not going to get anywhere. Give them an example. Discipline them because the day will come when they're going to leave the home. Another thing that worked against David, he had more than one wife. You know what that meant? He had a lot of kids, man. A lot of kids. It's a problem I find with many involved in the ministry in the church. The family is neglected for the sake of the work. I even fell into that myself. You can get to the place where you excuse neglecting your children for your doing this work for God. You're thinking, oh, God's going to cover me. Uh, I did think that. God's going to cover me. He'll cover me with my kids. Wrong. <laughs> Guys, I'm telling you, man, if I could go back and change anything when my kids were growing up, I'm telling you right now, the hobbies, the extra ministry, all that, I would have spent more time with them and gotten involved with them more. It's a regret that I've carried all these years and I'll carry it until I die. I was too busy when they were small. But the amazing thing is, I'm now never too busy to spend time with my grandchildren. <laughs> if they'll come over, when they come over, I'll do that. And I wanna spend time with them. I go out of my way now. If I can grab a half an hour, hour, or whatever with them, I will put everything aside and I'll do whatever I got to to help them and do that. Here's a scripture I'm sure CPS doesn't like. Protective services. Proverbs 23, verse 13 and 14. Do not withhold correction from a child. For if you beat him with a rod, he will not die. You shall beat him with a rod and deliver his soul from hell. Now, I'm not telling you to beat your kids. Don't get me wrong. It's the point behind it. You have to discipline. David did nothing about what happened. In fact, it's like he turned his head and just didn't want to deal with it, man. Just didn't want to deal with it. Ammon's lust turned into hatred. If Tamar would have stuck around, I'd guarantee you, he'd be punching her, he'd be slapping her around. That lust turned into hatred. That's what happens. People don't realize that, especially young people. You know, when you get older, you see that happening, you know it's gonna happen. Try telling a teenager that's gonna happen. It ain't gonna work. They're all Google-eyed, they're in love, and. They want to get married. They want to start a family. So whatever options out there and looks like it's going to work, I'm doing it. Well, what about checking with God? What about seeing if they're a godly woman or a godly man? If they're going to church, if they're reading the Bible, then you know you're getting something good. But they go and it backfires. I've never seen it not backfire. Now, it was Absalom who had hatred in his heart. And that hatred, it's going to lead to murder. Matthew 5, verse 21, 22. Look at verse 22. And Absalom spoke to his brother Ammon, neither good nor bad. He's playing the neutral card. 
For Absalom hated Ammon because he had forced his sister Tamar. And it came to pass after two full years that Absalom had sheep shearers in Baal Hazor, which is near Ephraim. So Absalom invited all the king's sons. Then Absalom came to the king and said, Kindly note your servant has sheep shearers. Please let the king and his servants go with your servant. But the king said to Absalom, No, my son, let us not all go now, lest we be a burden to you. Then he urged him, but he would not go, and he blessed him. And Absalom said, If not, please let my brother Ammon go with us. Uh-oh. You think the flag would have went up in David's head, right? And the king said to him, why should he go with you? But Absalom urged him. So he let Ammon and all the king's sons go with him. This is happening in David's home, just as the prophet Nathan had prophesied. David is paying for his sin, even though he's been forgiven. Sowing and reaping, man. Absalom had two years to work on his plan and to escape. Remember, David had murdered Uriah the Hittite. So Absalom used others to kill Ammon when he least expected it. David made Uriah drunk. <clears throat> so Absalom made his brother drunk and then killed him. Absalom did exactly what his father had left as an example. He committed premeditated murder. Verse 28. Now Absalom had commanded his servant saying, watch now when Ammon's heart is merry with wine. And when I say to you, strike Ammon, kill him. Do not be afraid. Have I not commanded you? Be courageous and valiant. So the servants of Absalom did to Ammon as Absalom had commanded. Then all the king's sons got up and each one got on his mew and they split, man. And it came to pass while they were on the way that news came to David saying, Absalom has killed all the king's sons and not one of them is left. So the king arose and tore his garments and lay on the ground. And all his servants stood by with their clothes torn. Then Jonadab, remember Jonadab, the son of Shimea, David's brother, the dude that instigated this? He answered and said, Let not my Lord suppose they have killed all the young men, the king's sons, for only Ammon is dead. For by the command of Absalom, this has been determined from that day that he forced his sister Tamar. Now therefore, let not my Lord the king take this thing to heart to think that all the king's sons are dead, for only Ammon is dead. Then Absalom fled. And the young man who was keeping watch lifted his eyes and looked, <clears throat> and there many people were coming from the road on the hillside behind him. And John Ab said to the king, Look, the king's sons are coming, as your servant said, so it is. So it was, as soon as he had finished speaking, that the king's sons indeed came, and they lifted up their voice and wept. Also the king and all his servants wept very bitterly. But Absalom fled and went to Telmai, the son of Amihad, king of Geshur. Guess where he went? He went to his grandpa, the king of Geshur. Maacah, his mother's dad. And David mourned for his son every day. So Absalom fled and went to Geshur and was there three years. And King David longed to go to Absalom for he had been comforted concerning Ammon because he was dead. David married Absalom's mother when his faith was at an all time low. When he left the land of Israel, totally out of God's will. Things may have been different if David had dealt with Ammon when he raped his sister Tamar. I mean, many believe David might have intended to set Absalom up as the next king. But as we're going to see, Absalom is already thinking the same thing. 
He's thinking the same thing. David is struggling. He's struggling over all this. He knows his son deserves punishment, Absalom. He knows it. But David was known for letting his sons do whatever they wanted. Chapter 14 is your homework. I want you to read it for next time. David finally brings Absalom home, but he punishes him by making him wait to be reconciled to him. It will be five whole years before David and Absalom will actually get to see each other again. Heavy stuff, man. You can't mess around with sin. You know, and I speak to me too, if only we would take to heart what we have learned in God's word. Yeah, we, we forget things, but that's why I read through the Bible yearly. That's why I'm in the word every day in my devotional time so that I can keep my mind fresh with God's word. So I know how to conduct myself. I know how to handle myself. I know how to be the man God desires me to be that I actually desire to be. But you gotta be in fellowship. You gotta be in Bible study, man, you got to. You gotta sing and worship the Lord. You have to be in God's word. That's where God reveals himself to us in his word. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we come before you. We thank you again for just the things you're teaching us, Lord. The life of David is heavy. I mean, you see the good, you see the bad, you see the ugly, you see it all. But yet we see God's hand. We see your hand, Lord, on David because his heart was sold out to you. Yeah, he let sin get a hold of him off and on. But his heart, he loved you, God. He loved you. And Lord, we love you. And we just want to have that same heart for you, Lord God. And I pray you would create that in all of us, especially in these final moments of the church age, the church dispensation that we are living in. You could come at any moment, Jesus. And we need to be prepared. We need to be ready. We need to be watching. Go before us this day and the rest of this week. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. I love you guys. I'll see you next time. God bless you all.